morning, everybody. Uh, today I'll be talking about an alternative model for teacher training in Bangladesh that we've been experimenting with. Uh, I represent the Access to Information program at the Prime Minister's office in Bangladesh, and we have been doing a lot of digital experimentation across a number of sectors, development sectors in the country, education being one of the most important ones. Uh, we have a very large education system in the country. I'll talk about it. Uh, the focus of the presentation is to discuss uh, a teacher's portal, which currently has about 50,000 teachers from primarily uh, secondary schools, some from primary schools as well, who are collaborating on technology-oriented uh, content for a, for a number of subjects. So they, they range from languages to uh, IT to science to math to religious studies, social studies, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I'll talk about how we see this as a very effective and cost-effective model for teacher training in Bangladesh emerging. But let me uh, talk about the context of the country. A uh, very poor country, uh, about $1,100 GDP per capita. 26% uh, of the population lives under a dollar a day uh, below the poverty line. Uh, literacy is about 60%, uh, 60 to 65%. Uh, English literacy is very low, and that's important for technology, because uh, English is the, still the language of technology, and that language understanding is very low, less than 5%. Uh, electricity, another prerequisite for technology, is also uh, not adequate in the country. About 50% of the area is under grid connection, and the rest uh, has some solar powers, but large part of the country is actually uh, without electricity. Mobile phone penetration has increased dramatically in the last uh, six years from about 50% uh, six years ago to about 75% uh, uh, household, 90%, 75% uh, individuals and 90% household penetration now. Internet penetration has had even a more dramatic rise in the last six years from uh, less than 1% to 25% now, 65-fold increase in the last six years. Now let me talk specifically about teacher training. Uh, we have over 900,000 teachers, a very large system. About 39% female teachers. We have over 143,000 schools, uh, mostly primary schools, so over uh, 80, 90,000 are actually primary schools. Uh, teacher training institutions, about 210, 81 public and the rest uh, private. Uh, if you look at the teacher trainer ratio, it's it's actually quite alarming. 357 teachers to one trainer. And teachers who have received training on how to integrate ICT into the pedagogical process, that's very small as well, 4%. Now, we actually ran a study on the limitations of our traditional teacher training process. And this gives you a, a sampling of the the, the, the large responses. I won't go into the details of it, but uh, if you look at the, the major ones, traditional teacher training is seen as something that's too little and too infrequent. So we're talking about duration is too small, about 44% of the respondents have said that. Training is not comprehensive, about 38% teachers have said that. Lack of skilled trainers, about 37% teachers have said that. Proper infrastructure is not uh, in place. 30% teachers have said that. Convenient, inconvenient location. 19% teachers have said that because they have to travel to distant locations to get teacher training. So if we summarize that, what we see is that traditional teacher training, the face-to-face -face context is not effective and has been a huge waste of money and resources uh, for the last 15 or 20 years that we have been running this. So it's short, it's not hands-on, it's disruptive to school uh, resources because uh, the teachers are already ina inadequate and when you send these inadequate teachers to far off training locations, school, uh, uh, the process, the, the teaching learning in classrooms actually get negatively affected. Now refresher training. About 79% of the teachers responded that they don't even know why refresher training doesn't happen because they don't even know what refresher training is. So, which basically means that refresher training doesn't happen. So, a teacher may actually get training 
at a five-year, ten-year interval sometimes. So the curriculum changes during that time, the world changes during that time, teachers' expectations and students' expectations change that time. So it's really, refresher is missing completely from the scenario. But teachers also feel that they need it. So 63% of the teachers have said that they need refresher training to receive latest and updated information on the subject matters. 59% uh, have said they need revision of the original training content because things have changed since the time they have actually gone to a training. Uh, problem sharing and experience sharing is, is important through refresher training and that's also missing in the process. So these are very important aspects of teacher training that are completely missing from our traditional teacher training scenario. Now we received a wake-up call a few years ago and before the wake-up call let me talk about what happened in the country. Uh, a number of uh, very large international hardware and software vendors had been doing teacher training for our teachers since the early 2000. So between 2000 and 2010, we actually took about 10 to 12,000 of our teachers through ICT, quote unquote, training by large hardware and software vendors. And the government supported that. We also got money from different uh, international donors. And then there was another stream of developing ICT labs in schools. So about 3,000 of our schools, I mentioned that we have over 140,000 schools. So only 3,000 of these schools have now set up IT labs with maybe 10 computers each. And they don't get used much because why should they be used? They use only uh, these labs for Microsoft Office. Kids are not interested in that. They use these labs for teachers uh, grading and writing letters to the ministries. Again, no impact on the educational process. So we've spent millions of dollars of our own money, international donors' money, money from perhaps our software and hardware vendors, to show nothing for, for it as a result. So in 2010, we were running this uh, workshop with about 23 teachers from seven high schools, seven secondary schools, and they said that you got it all wrong. You don't need to teach us how to use the computers. You don't need to teach us uh, how to use these uh, sophisticated software because we don't need them. We don't really need them for teaching in the classrooms. What we need are two things. You should teach us how to find content on the internet. So teach us how to use Google for search. Search using English and search using the local language Bangla because we have a lot of Bangla content by that time. Uh, and teach us how to plagiarize so that we can actually find stuff on the internet and put them in PowerPoint or whatever presentation tools that we have. So those are the two things that we need. So that resulted in the birth of what we now call multimedia classrooms. So we're now experimenting with uh, 20,000 schools, 20,000 secondary schools where we have set up this idea of a multimedia classroom where teachers use the internet and a laptop and a projector to just find content and, and show them in classrooms. A second thing that was also born is a teacher portal. That is the main focus of my presentation today. This teacher portal has uh, unleashed an unprecedented era of co-creation of content and collaboration amongst the teachers. Now, this is what a multimedia classroom looks like in about 20,000 schools. Uh, we deliberately focused on the schools that are underserved. So it not only prevented digital divide in a sense, it also prevented educational divide because all these divides go hand in hand. The digital divide that we keep talking about globally, the economic divide, education divide, they actually go all hand in hand. So unless we address the root of the problem, we're going to keep widening the divide by putting more sophisticated content in the schools which have better connectivity, more sophisticated a teacher training process in schools that have better resources, that have more wealthier parents. So we wanted to address the issues at the grassroots level. And that's, that's the whole purpose of this multimedia classroom and the teacher portal uh, as a combination. We also have developed uh, or converted all our textbooks, about 305 of them, into e-books so that the teachers can actually access them, updated books which they may not get on time. Uh, over the internet. 
uh, and that goes across primary, secondary, our religious stream, which is quite big, madrasas, and our vocational stream as well. And recently, uh, through an innovation fund that we have launched, we have uh, granted a fund to an NGO, which has converted over a hundred of these books, the main books in our primary and secondary education, into what is called digital talking books for the visually challenged. So this whole process, this wake-up call that we received in 2010, uh, forced us to rethink teacher training around content, around the practice of teacher training, around how mentoring is done, which is totally missing, uh, or used to be missing before the teacher portal was introduced, uh, around collaboration. Again, a missing subject till the teacher portal was introduced. A method of competition, which I'll talk about in a bit, and a constructivist set of activities which better or more qualified or more prepared teachers are sharing with the less, less prepared teachers. These constructivist approaches for teaching learning in the classrooms. So this is the teacher's portal, teachers.gov.bd. Unfortunately, it's in the, in the Bangla language for obvious reasons. I mean, the teachers speak in Bangla, they teach in Bangla, they use Bangla as the medium of instruction. So obviously, the portal has to be in Bangla, except for the subject of English, which you see in the middle. So this portal actually has close to 50,000 teachers that have uh, gathered in the last four years. The target is to reach about 350,000 teachers, which is a little over a third of our teachers by 2018. And we've seen in the last two years, the adoption curve is accelerating at a faster clip because word of mouth gets around, teachers' awards are being given through the portal, and so on and so forth. Some of the uh, key features for the portal that make it a collaborative platform, uh, the content is categorized by the curriculum. So it's by subject, it's by classes, it's by uh, chapters of different books. So it's very directly tied to the curriculum and the, and the, and the textbooks. And it features uh, pictures, video, animation, audio, PowerPoint slides. And a lot of these are either created from scratch by the teachers, found on the internet as free resources or creative commons resources, or even proprietary resources that are stolen. And the teachers don't know the difference. So this is a legal issue that we are, we are trying to address, but we are more interested and more concerned about the educational possibilities of this rather than the legal part at the moment. There is uh, blogging and Facebooking that's actually attached to the portal. So that gives these teachers an unprecedented way to keep in touch with each other. They troubleshoot each other's problems. They provide peer learning. So as I mentioned before, the more prepared teachers are very ready to impart their knowledge and understanding and methodologies and pedagogical processes to their less prepared teachers. So you'd see one teacher from the northern part of the country curating a content, putting it up with some comments and the, the process that they follow in classrooms. And a teacher, less prepared teacher perhaps from the southern part of the country would pick that up and use that in the classroom. And this content actually follows a very mature teaching learning process in the classroom because it prompts teachers to do activities that they would not have done by looking at the teacher's guide or remembering what they learned 10 years ago in a, in a far off or almost irrelevant teacher training class. So it's a very active, organic process that this uh, portal has, uh, has unleashed in the country. Uh, best and active teachers. So every week, there are three teachers that are picked up by the system as the most active teachers because they have generated the most content, they've gotten the most comments and ratings. They have been able to mobilize other teachers in that process. So they, they are recognized by the system. And this recognition for going the extra mile and becoming excellent teachers is important in the system. We've also, in the last two years, we've also been holding what are, what are called teacher summits. And the education minister actually gives out best teacher awards. Again, this was never done before. And this teacher's portal has created this unprecedented platform for recognition of excellence. So the human connection, more than technology, uh, drives adoption and collaboration. I think that's very key. So it's not technology that's really important. It's technology used as a tool 
as a tool that was not there before, as a tool that exists today because mobile phones, internets are in the hands of almost every teacher. And that's what making this possible. So if you look at some of the statistics, uh, the most active teachers come in the 25 to 44 year age group and with teaching experience between 5 and 14 years. So that's the most active as, as would be understood. They're the ones most excited about technology. They're the ones who are risk averse or rather risk takers, not risk averse. The others are risk, more risk averse. They're the ones who like to experiment. They're the ones who like to uh, collaborate with others through social media. And if you look at the subjects, which subject teachers are most active, you, again, this is no mystery, the ICT, science, math, English, the subjects where you need deeper subject knowledge, you need more collaboration, because in most parts of the country, this deeper subject knowledge is, is missing. So that's where you see the most activity happening within the portal, which is actually uh, very promising. Why do I use this portal as a teacher? We've seen that 94% of the uh, teachers have said they, they use the portal to download content. Content that's useful in the classrooms to be used in the multimedia classrooms. And 90% of the teachers say that they also upload content. That means a lot of the teachers are actually creating their own content. It could be as simple as, a, as, as taking a picture of, uh, of a rainy day. It could be as simple as taking the picture of a river that is explained in, the, in, in geography and the textbooks don't have the right picture in a very legible format. So it's, it's very simple stuff that's actually unleashing a lot of collaboration, a lot of uh, 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 work within teachers. The benefits, we see the largest benefits are skills development. If I summarize, it's continuous professional development. Uh, it's very important that we are seeing in the, in the portal. Uh, better teaching learning outcomes, uh, new idea generation about what to do in classrooms, and greater social connections. And some teachers have also said, if you notice, 20% uh, of the teachers have said that their social standing has increased, so which is a very surprising thing for us, but this is a reality because teachers are sometimes neglected in Bangladesh as people uh, in the leadership standing. They are not seen as leaders anymore. But this new platform where the teachers are actually gathering together, they're forming an alternative for a union, I would say, uh, is giving them better standing, better policy voice. And compared with traditional training, uh, teachers are saying that they can attend training from home. Skills development is happening in an unprecedented way in an organic way and in a timely manner. So these are very important aspects of what this teacher portal is doing. Refresher training is happening from home, so they don't have to leave their uh, premises of school and their uh, home areas to get this training. They can just look at the content at night, they can collaborate with other teachers through social media and through phones, and that's how the teacher training is happening now. Community development is also a very important aspect of this portal. Uh, a teacher's community is organically forming across the country in a way that has never happened before. And we have some teachers' unions, but these unions were never focused on the teaching learning process. They were always focused on their salaries, their benefits, uh, the, the, the policy voice with the ministry, always talked about other issues and not about teaching learning. And this is the first time this community has come together to talk about teaching learning, improving teaching learning in classrooms. For female teachers, about 81% have said that this is very important for them because they don't get to go to this training for two reasons. One is that they don't get selected. As I mentioned in the beginning, 39% of our teachers are female. So they don't get selected and they have family responsibilities also. So they can't leave their small children. They can't leave their in-laws perhaps in a, in a socio-economic context like Bangladesh and being able to get trained from home from their schools is actually phenomenal for them and we are seeing equal participation of female teachers in the portal as well so which is also surprising without that the male participation would be much higher but female participation is almost uh, the same as male participation and this is because they feel 
less fortunate to go to physical training, they feel underserved, they feel left out of the training process and this is a way for them to, to be part of the process and this is hugely empowering for them. So we ran a small study of how the teacher's portal and the multimedia classroom in 20,000 schools uh, is increasing teaching learning. And uh, statistics, early statistics, I would say that uh, this is not a very comprehensive and deep study. Uh, this is a small sampling that we've worked with. But it gives us really good signs. It gives us reasons for hope and optimism. Uh, the teaching learning has improved in classrooms. The students are actually doing much better than before. Teacher confidence has increased. This is again important. The subject teachers who were not trained on physics, who were not trained on chemistry, who were not trained on the language, especially English, uh, or they got training maybe 10 years ago, they now feel connected to a community that is teaching them. They are creating content and the content creation process is also giving them high degree of confidence that they can teach better in the classroom. So this is again another dimension of uh, how the teacher portal and the multimedia classroom has helped the teaching learning process. Uh, the head teachers also agree. So we uh, did a survey of the head teachers, how they see the process, whether they see this as a, as a way to take control away from them, as, it, as, a, as a way to take authority away from them, and that has not happened because a community is, is emerging and some of the head teachers are also part of the community. Now, this is a quote from a secondary teacher from a rural school. Uh, I see teacher's portal as an open peer-to-peer -peer learning tool. I have learned things here that I was never taught anywhere else. Here I'm allowed to the opportunity to continuously learn and grow from others' contents and advice. In the beginning, the quality of the contents I uploaded didn't rate high on the pedagogical scale, but over the years I've improved through viewing better contents and constructive feedback from my colleagues on the portal. The best part is, as a teacher, my learning is not limited to me only. Whatever I learn, I apply that in my class, which ultimately benefits hundreds of my students. The training has undoubtedly contributed to my professional development as much as, if not more, than any formal training. I'm towards the end of my presentation. So I want to leave you with what we are calling the teacher empowerment framework. This has several components. At the heart of it is the multimedia classroom, which is the infrastructure that teachers use to impart teaching, learning, and classrooms. But then it also has the four C's, as we call them. Continuous learning, which is more like on-the-job learning, on-the-job training. It's self-directed, anytime, anywhere learning process. Uh, we have been able to leverage a lot of public and private training content. And we are forming new partnerships with very large NGOs who are active in the in the education space to bring in new teacher training content. We are partnering with international content provider organizations, which will provide content in a very contextual form, in a form that the teachers can customize. If the content comes at a, in, in a format that the teachers have to sort of adopt with their understanding, without being able to control, without being able to customize, they're not very interested. They need content that they can customize. I think that's a very important uh, part of this. Uh, so co-creation. The second part, the second pillar of uh, our teacher empowerment framework. So greater relevance of content through customization. There is a lot of mentoring happening uh, through co-creation. Teachers are creating their own content that they use in classrooms. Uh, they have lots of debates in the blogging and the Facebook platforms about what is useful, what is effective in classrooms. And interestingly, the cost of content generation. There was a period uh, before the 2010 wake-up call where we had a lot of content generation companies from the local markets and also from the international markets that were supplying content. And that was not as useful as the content that the teachers are actually creating. Because one, they have higher ownership of it. Two, these contents are actually being produced at a much greater speed they may not be the, the most mature content, they may not be the most sophisticated content that you will get from a company which produces content in animation and in video, but this is good enough. And the good enough thing is actually very important. Good enough for the teachers to revolutionize the teaching learning process in classrooms. The third C is collaboration. I've talked a lot about it. It's one of the most important aspects of the teacher portal. 
And uh, in the BET show in the last three days, we've heard, I think, uh, numerous presentations uh, from Gates Foundation, from Google Education, from uh, many of the luminaries of education uh, uh, in today's world, many of the education for, uh, foremost education thinkers. And they've all, also always identified collaboration as a very key aspect of teacher training, as a key aspect of uh, confidence development for teachers. The fourth C in this framework is competition. I mentioned that there is a sense of competition that we have created within the portal. That they compete for excellence, they compete for leadership, they compete for forming communities. So this competition is also driving the quality of content, the quality of teaching, coupled with the reward and recognition system that we have put in place, and we're trying to improve that further. So this framework uh, in jest, and perhaps maybe a bit more formally, we are calling the E equals MC to the power of four framework. Okay, so based off of Einstein, I hope he doesn't mind. So it's the empowerment through multimedia classroom, continuous learning, co-creation, collaboration, and comp competition. So what does the future lie for us? What are we trying to do into the future? Uh, we realize that the 21st century skills are missing in our curriculum. So we have talked incessantly about 21st century skills in the last few years. And this bet show was probably 50% focused on 21st century skills, which are critical thinking, creativity, communi communication, collaboration, a lot of the softer side of curriculum. And this is almost entirely missing in our teaching learning process. So this is something that we want to incorporate in our teaching learning process. And very importantly, we realize that unless we have a robust assessment framework for 21st century skills, this will always be a pilot. So we'll see schools that will do 21st century skills development, curriculum, uh, teaching uh, in, a, in a sort of ad hoc uh, way. And we'll see a lot of pilots of that. And we're seeing that around the world. But unless we put together a comprehensive assessment framework to assess 21st century skills, we will not see large-scale adoption. So we realize that and we're working at the policy level for that. Uh, we want to eliminate the finish the syllabus approach for teachers. I mean, the teachers are primarily focused on finishing a syllabus that they're given in the teacher guide. They're saying that, okay, so you have to go from chapter one through chapter 12. And the most important aspect of teacher training, uh, uh, teacher uh, uh, teaching learning process in the classroom is to be able to finish those 12 chapters. It doesn't matter what the students actually are, uh, picked up what kind of activities they did. It's a bad matter of rote delivery of those 12 chapters. So that's something that we want to eliminate if we have to focus on the 21st century skills. The other important aspect is to engage the students in the process. Uh, right now, the teacher's portal does not engage students. It engages the teachers in a very meaningful and effective way, but we realize that the students have to be engaged to co-design the classroom space, We've seen many examples of that in the bed show. We realize that the students can actually generate hugely improved content, sometimes much better than the teachers because they are naturally gravitating towards technology. They can do much better searches. They can put together much more interesting PowerPoint and animations. So we need to in involve the, the students in this process, and we're not doing that today. And student collaboration in a meaningful way uh, within schools and across schools. Again, something that we hope to do as soon as, as we have uh, better internet connectivity to the schools. Right now, the internet connectivity only supports the teachers, not the students. And that's something that we're working on with the telcos and with the internet service providers. So scaling up this process requires a bottom-up approach that we have already begun in terms of the teacher's portal, the different innovation meetups physically, uh, student engagement that we're actually planning. But at the same time, there are many activities across the nation, uh, very large teacher training programs, very large policy initiatives that are not joined together in this, in this process. So these are things that we actually have to coordinate and bring together to have the policy adoption. Uh, the bureaucracy is very strong in Bangladesh. They make all the decisions. Teachers don't. Teacher trainers don't. So the bureaucrats 
within the Ministry of Education and within the Prime Minister's Office, which is what I, what I represent, and in other ministries, in other ministries have to come together. So this visioning exercise for what we need in our 21st century education, 21st century skills, 21st century uh, products in our students, and 21st century teachers, that has to be understood and delivered on by the bureaucrats as well. And uh, lastly, but very importantly, the strong political will that, have, that we have seen from this digital Bangladesh vision that was formulated about uh, six years ago. And the education ministry is leading many of the efforts within the digital Bangladesh vision uh, by developing an ICT in education roadmap, the first ever ICT, uh, first ever education policy in the country after 40 years of our country's birth and an education act that we are working on that will be passed in the parliament sometime this year. So all these have to be connected together to make sure what we have started from the bottom up as a bottom up process actually gets adopted in the policy process and becomes scaled up throughout the nation. So in summary, the strategy that we have taken is what we call the ready, shoot, aim strategy. We don't spend a lot of time developing a top-down policy, a top-down strategy, and start implementing. We have taken the approach that we'll do a lot of pilots, join them together with the hope that they will be joined with the very active outlook that the policy process is, is actually plugged into this from the Prime Minister's office, and that's where we do the aiming. So we shoot many arrows, and they land on many different places. And when we realize the arrows that have made the most impact, that's when we aim and bring it into the policy discourse. Thanks very much.